Welcome everyone to another episode of Test Chamber. I'm your host, Andrew Reiner. Today I got Tim Terry playing the game. Hi. Tim is a recent uh, Transformers fan. He's started watching the cartoon series uh, from Generation 1 back in the 80s. And you watch an episode pretty much every day, don't you? I try to. And then I also have with us our Transformers expert. He knows everything about this universe, collects the toys, reads the comics, Matt Miller. I do like some Transformers. And Matt, you did the review for us on this. Uh, why don't you let us know what's going on with this game here? Yeah, sure. Well, right now we're uh, in the first kind of third of the game uh, and we're playing as Jazz, a character who's familiar to anybody who remembers the old G1 cartoon. Uh, and Jazz is on a mission along with his buddy Cliff Jumper to go find out what happened to Grimlock. Grimlock's one of the most powerful Autobots in, uh, in the Autobot army. And he uh, appeared to abandon his post along with his whole squad. And so now we're trying to find out where he went. It's kind of cool. That's I've interesting. Been, I've been playing through the game, and you just see this trail of destruction that you're following. That exactly. is Grimlock's wake. It's pretty yeah. awesome. What's interesting about that, too, is having watched some of the uh, you know the 80s cartoon, is that the Dinobots, I think, have like deserted the Autobots at least twice I th for varying reasons. You know, whether it's Decepticons sort of tempting them to strike out on their own or whatever. So that's that's pretty consistent with what happened. Yeah, they do a great job in the game of, like, even if they're not directly copying individual storylines from the old Generation 1 cartoons, there's so many homages to them, just like what you're talking about. The, the Dinobots act a way that is like what they acted like back in the old cartoons or in the old comics. Um, and this is kind of a call-out to the... Uh the Insecticons. Oh yeah, Insecticons are a really big important part of this particular game. Uh, we learn a lot more about them and their connection to Shockwave later in the game, but right now Jazz is sort of encountering them uh, for the first time, and uh, Insecticons in, in this version of the fiction are these kind of subterranean dwelling creatures on Cybertron, and they've begun emerging onto the surface um, in the wake of the... Uh, uh, the core shutting down in the last game in War for Cybertron. And that's causing all sorts of problems. There it nice. goes. And I've been playing through the game at home, and i got to say, the production values are through the roof. It is pretty. Yeah, every little room you go into, the the animations on the Transformers, it seems like it's every bit as big of a production as like a Call of Duty for Activision. Oh, no doubt. In fact, I think that's a good game... In some regards, not every regard, to compare uh, to, there's a, there's a lot of elements in Transformers Fall of Cybertron that are about delivering these big, crazy set-piece moments with explosions and big story events, very like a Call of Duty game. Uh, one of the things, though, that makes it different is that uh, there's a lot of other systems at play that you might not have in a traditional Call of Duty single-player game, not the least of which is like a weapon upgrade system, crazy individual character powers, which you just saw uh, Tim kind of grappled up uh, to, a, to a higher ledge. That's Jazz's special powers, this, this like awesome grapple hook that he's got. I um, mean, every, every different character you play has a different one. I got to point out, Tim, you got to get, uh, get moving. Oh, am I timed right now? Yeah. Oh, yeah. You want to get out of here? Okay. Let me, let me do that. Pull that down. So Jazz has this this grapple hook, which is really cool. Uh, it's used later in a amazing sniper sequence, where he has a sniper rifle and he's going against these destroy those things, almost the like Dinobot things. like swoop Insecticons that are there you go. are We're flying around with sniper breath. rifles as well. Yeah, it's super cool. Um, it's one of the most unique sniper sections I've seen in a game recently because it's all like. Uh, it's all about mobility. Usually when you have a sniping sequence, it's about like, I'm going to settle down in this one area and take these guys out. And uh, this game has this awesome sniping sequence with Jazz where if you do that, you're going to die. You yeah, you're const constantly moving. Yeah, it's really neat. I died. You did. It's okay. I'm it happens to the best that. of us. But oh, yeah. I should point out, I don't think we pointed out earlier that... Um, at one point, Tim made uh, the wrong move. He went back down to the original starting point where we started this, and on the wall was one of the Dinobots mm -hmm. in like a stasis pod. Talk about the story a little bit, Miller. Yeah, so like I said, Grimlock and his uh, Lightning Strike Coalition, as they are called prior to the time that they become uh, Dinobots, which is actually an homage to some of the old comics. Uh, the Lightning Strike Coalition, they abandon their posts, and it causes all sorts of problems for the Autobots because the Decepticons are able to breach their lines. 
So the question becomes like, why did Grimlock abandon his post? And so what uh, what we discover in this level is that at least one of the Dinobots is met with a pretty grim fate, and he's Grimlock uh, fate. Uh, that, that was that was a good one, Tim. Thanks. Uh, and and is is stuck in stasis lock down in this underground area. There's like a little Matrix moment for you there. That was dramatic. Uh, shoot those things behind you. Um, but later on, we learn that uh, some of the other Dinobots, it's not quite so, uh, uh, not so quite so cut and dry, um, as I think most people have been following this game know. Grimlock is still around, and he plays a pretty big part in the latter part of the game. Now, I was a big fan of the Generation One comic books. Oh yeah, uh, that's probably my favorite Transformers fiction, like the old Marvel ones, right? Yep. It, which is great because they're continuing them now mm -hmm. over at, uh, is it IDW that yep, has it? exactly. Uh, so it's a series from the 80s. Maybe it continued into the 90s, and they're picking up with issue 81. Yeah. But Grimlock was a huge player in that. Uh, and right now, I think, is it's Dinobot Month at IDW. Totally so is. every one of their comics is, is Dinobot-related. I want to note that I really like... Um, Jazz's transformation animation. You know, kind of like breakdancey. Yeah, it's it's super cool. They they uh, the guys at um, High Moon Studios spent a tremendous amount of time. Their animators making special individual animations and sounds for each different character character's transformation, and each one of them really speaks to the personality of the character. It's subtle I love. too, which I like. Yeah, that is a lake of energy, John. Is it? This is a big deal because right now for the Autobots. They're trying to get off the planet, and there's, they barely have any Energon left. And they suddenly discover here that uh, there's this entire lake that hasn't been tapped yet, or at least that they didn't know about yet, that the Decepticons seem to have found on their own. Hey, Miller, is talking about the beginning of a game too much of a spoiler? I don't think, like, the very beginning? Because that is such a call-out to Transformers fans. Oh, yeah. I mean, basically, you've got uh, the opening level... Um, is is a echo of the original G1 cartoon. It's oh. a departure from uh, Cybertron. Headed for that mountain? Do they like crash land in a volcano or a mountain? Just a mountain, right? Uh, Just a mountain, I think. I thought it was a volcano. Oh, maybe it was back in the prehistoric ages and then they sat there for... Something like that. Well, I like know, countless, countless years. I like that idea. You know what's always interesting to me, thinking back on the G1 cartoon, is that the Autobots just stay rooted in the side of that mountain, but the Decepticons have like <laughs> six or seven place. different layers that they're able to produce for no apparent reason. So these guys are pretty cool. These are like the, uh, they're like these spider sniper bots. They can hang off the walls. And you're getting the first glimpse of some of the, uh, what we were talking about before, this mobility that Jazz has. So you're, you can totally move all around this big open space that you're in right now. And you want to try to take out as many dudes as you can before they hone in on you and start uh, shooting at you. Yeah, you know, what I played uh, at E3 what actually turned me on to Transformers in general was um, the uh, Vortex's level, who's sort of like a pseudo triple changer. I can turn into a jet, a helicopter, and um, a robot, you know. And... What I liked about it is that his level was so suited to, you know, how he controls and stuff, and it seems like this is just more of that. Yeah, the, the greatest strength of the game, and the biggest challenge I think that it faces, is that it's, it has a huge amount of variety in the gameplay experience. Right now we're having this sniper sequence, but other times you're playing stealth, other times it's like a flight combat nice. game, and other times it's a straight-up shooter. Um, and as a result, it's, it's a lot of fun to kind of switch between the levels and see what's coming next. Uh, the only downside, I think, that comes out of that is that you never have the, any one gameplay sequence really develop into something incredibly complex. Okay. Uh, like, this is about as complicated as the jazz stuff will ever get. But that's okay, because as soon as you get to the next level, you're going to have something different to explore. And uh, the game also has competitive multiplayer where you get to design your own transformer mm -hmm. and something called escalation mode. Yeah. Escalation returns from war for Cybertron. It was really popular. It's basically the, the, uh, the horde mode of the franchise. Um, but I think they've developed it much, uh, much more this time so that there's a lot greater sense of progression through the escalation levels that you you're playing in. And there's lots of different characters that you can try. Um, multiplayer and co-op in this game are, I think high moon is really banking on, 
having a lot of lo longevity to the title through those uh, those two experiences. <laughs> this is where the where you really got to start moving. You can see all those. Yeah, uh, look at all those sniper bolts. Oh no! Yeah, I'm being pretty nice. Here. All right. Hey Miller, actually, I want to show the beginning of the game. Okay. We should we should really show that. Let's let's take a break here and we'll we'll jump right to it. All right, we're back. We're taking a look at the beginning of the game, and uh, I was blown away by this. I was like, "Holy crap, where are they going with this?" And uh, I won't say anything. We're not going to get all the way to the end of this, but uh, yeah, there's a moment um, that I think fans are going to freak out about. Dude, I, I really hope that this series goes to Earth and it starts hitting those notes. See, what I want to see, something that hasn't been done in the Transformers fiction all that much, is the period between when they leave Cybertron and when they get to Earth. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of potential, I think, within the fiction for the this, all these thousands of years that they're gone um, to add in some cool stuff that happens. That's true. I like how they don't have radar on this thing. <laughs> so this is the arc from the G1 cartoon. Uh, this is the ship they use to get to Earth. And here's the big battle. This is pretty much verbatim the first episode of the TV show. Yep. Oh, that's right. Yeah, I forgot about that first episode. A lot goes down in that first episode. It really does. From, like, you know, this kind of attack to explaining why all the Transformers look like Earth vehicles on Earth. I mean, I got to say, it's one of my favorite first, like, opening tutorials of a game. They do a great job of, like, integrating storytelling with uh, giving you the basics of, like, how you control the game mm -hmm. um, while still kind of feeling like you're, you're having meaningful gameplay. And, That's it. and obviously the uh, Call of Duty style of doing invert or not, they, they mm -hmm. let you figure it out just by moving. And here's, you really get to see the production values uh, in this level in particular. So, Tim, you brought up earlier that uh, Vortex, the triple changer, have you met uh, Astro Train yet? Okay, so Astro Train, I was immediately curious about Astro Train from the um, beginning introduction of the second season. They show him off. I mean, you know, he's a he's a robot that's a train, and then he I mean, he's a, he's a, a true triple changer. Vortex, we're talking about him as a triple changer, but he's really a Combaticon, one of the guys who forms into Bruticus. But he's Astro still a train, helicopter, but he can like tuck yeah, in his blades. Yeah, exactly. But Astro Train totally had three completely different forms. Okay. Right? So I saw an episode where I I think, uh, predictably, uh, Megatron and company stole some Energon or something, and then. We're trying to get away, and then Astro Train was going through this mountain in train form. <laughs> and so they fly over it, and they're like, all right, Astro Train, we're going to put this Energon in you. And then this little hatch opens up on top of it, and they put it in there. And then it passes through a mountain, and then on the other side of the mountain turns into a space shuttle that's bigger than it was when it was a train. An opening opens on the bottom, and then all Megatron and company just fly into him anyway. So they made like this big ado about, like, ah, oh, we can transport things with this train, but... It can also just turn into a spaceship. Why wouldn't it always be a spaceship <laughs> if it can fly in our atmosphere? Talking about uh, Transformers changing in size, that's something I I think they just kind of left out of the fiction now moving yeah. forward is like Megatron turning into a tiny gun. That, uh, that he... Soundwave turning into a little cassette player. Yeah, that's the thing is like the, the size has changed so dramatically. And Megatron, sometimes he'll be a gigantic gun and, um, you know, he'll shoot himself. Or he'll go into Starscream's hand, the one person who he doesn't trust at all, literally puts his life in the hands of, like, his biggest rival. And in one episode, even Optimus Prime holds Megatron, like, and, and shoots a dude. And uh, speaking of Starscream, here's a little call out to all of you Game Informer fans. Back when we used to do this glossary of terms in the magazine, uh, there was one month uh, I came up with something called Slapping the Grimlock. Which is just a saying that everybody was saying. So in the glossary, we used to do funny things every month in there. And one of them was slapping the Grimlock. And Miller, when you went on uh, the cover story trip, found out that that term might be in this game. Yeah, you know, I haven't found it yet. But supposedly, uh, we, we talked to Tej, the creative director uh, of 
Fall of Cybertron, and he loved this story of the idea that we at one point in our magazine had come up with this idea of slapping the Grimlock, and it had never really been described exactly what it was all about, but it was kind of this funny phrase. What is slapping the Grimrock, Grimlock? Then? No, no one knows. Whatever you but want it's it a to cool be. thing. All the all the kids are saying. Oh, okay. But apparently, and Starscream says it. We think that it that he actually followed through. The teach followed through and ended up putting it somewhere in the game as a little little secret nod. So people are gonna have to watch out for that uh, and see if they can find what it. What makes you think that Starscream says it? Uh, they, because that I think that's that's what they uh, oh, okay. implied they were gonna try to do. Uh, and we have a, uh, a little audio clip okay. uh, that they sent over. I'm wondering how that will get sort of uh, organically. There's a little. There's a little bit of. It'd be a little spoilerish to talk too much about exactly where that okay. might come up, but I think I've got a pretty good idea now. Whoa, gotcha. that was crazy. Yeah. Yeah, you get the sense through this level that the Ark is is really this huge, uh, this huge ship. I mean, it's basically carrying the last Autobots to remain on Cybertron, as many as they could get onto this ship. Uh, in the hope that they can find salvation have we elsewhere. Seen, have we seen Teletran 1 yet? Effectively, you're seeing Teletran throughout the ship. They've Teletran in this version of the fiction is is almost like the internet, except almost has its own intelligence. It's the computer like, network like Edie? Sprint. that exists throughout, uh, throughout Cybertron. And when the Autobots decide to leave, they actually load as much of Teletran onto the Ark as they can, like the actual information system. <laughs> Download that internet, Yeah, exactly. Autobots. Okay. And it's, it's how they're carrying their culture away from Cybertron with them. All their, like, art and history and architecture and all that kind of stuff. Well, we're getting close to the end of this level, and I don't want to spoil what happens for, for people that are going to play the game, but I'm loving the hell out of this game this so is far. Fun. This is I'm really about cool. halfway through it. Uh, it's a great shooting experience, delivers a nice challenge, and uh, for Transformers fans, it is kind of the ultimate fan service. It really and if is. you don't know what this is all about, and you want, and you feel like you're left behind, like play War for Cybertron. It's still fun. Um, and then you know I, the uh, the original G1 is uh, is still on Netflix. So and, and you know what? It. I think even the, I would say about this game, one of the great things that they've done is make this game accessible to somebody who didn't play War for Cybertron, right. who hasn't seen G1 of Transformers. Still a great introduction just, to all the characters. It's a great, like, shooting experience with lots of variety to it. Crazy sci-fi action with giant robots blowing each other up. Um, I think it's a, I think it could be a, a game that could bring some new people into the Transformers fandom. And Miller's review is on the site. Definitely go read that. We'll link it into this story. Uh, thanks for watching everyone and thank you guys for joining me we'll see you in a few short days for the next episode of Test Chamber